Hello, I'm Jackie Barry, author of the new book of icebreakers and energizers for speakers and trainers called Experiential Speaking. And I'm here today with Simon Raybould, who is the author of a website and a book and a training course, as far as I know, all called Presentation Genius. So there's not a lot he doesn't know about presentations and what makes him different is he talks about the science behind it. I have to confess though, that the choice of the phrase presentation genius was not mine. That was the publishers. They wanted the book to be called that. I would have called it how to make your presentation slightly less sucky, but you know, that doesn't sell. <laughs> Good point. Well, one of the things we have in common is the activities that I've got in my book are all underpinned by uh, psychological theory. It's making your audience do something that has a point that's going to help them remember your message more clearly because they're involved in an activity. And I know that you also use some audience participation in the work you do when you're training people. So can you tell me a bit about what are your favourite exercises? Um, my favourites are always the one where you get people to do the actual presentations, but those are the bits that the audience absolutely hate. And you always, of course, do those right at the end of the day, not at the start. Um, but the bits that are most useful for the audience, uh, there's one where I simply show a, a pair of stick figures on the slide behind me and um, simply ask the question, what's going on? And then we spend five minutes trying to figure out why everybody sees a completely different interpretation of the same 12 straight lines and, and circles and things. Really to start a conversation about how different people perceive the same thing in different ways and how as a presenter and a speaker, you have to be able to be aware of that and accommodate the audience's perception of what you're saying rather than your own perception of what you're saying. So it's, it's a way of starting a conversation more than anything else. I'm interested in the point you made just now that you get them to do something by the end of the day that you know they're going to hate. Um, or you, you feel that they might, how do you get them in a, a mindset where they're willing to dive in and do something that a lot of people um, don't love? Well, for a start, I'm onto a winner because the fact that they've come to me to help with their presentations means that they are prepared at least to, to try and to have a go. The worst thing that you can do as a trainer, though, is throw people in the deep end and see if they drown because with presentation, with all training, but with presentations training in particular, if you stand up and say to people, make a presentation and then critique it, all that happens is that they lose confidence and that they fall back upon the bad habits that they already have because they don't know any better, which is why the presentation stuff that I do always has to come at the end when people have learned how to do it properly. And the way to get them there, the best analogy I use is a bit like learning to play tennis. You don't just throw somebody onto court with Andre Agassi and say, play tennis, because they're just not going to see the ball let alone hit it. What you do is give them practice on, this is how you serve. These are exercises on serving. These are exercises on forehand. These are exercises on backhand. Now let's put the serving and forehand together. Good. Now let's put the serving and backhand together. Now let's put the, so you teach them all the techniques that they've got before you start to, so by the time they get to the end of the thing, when they're making the presentations, actually that's easy because they've done all the little individual incremental bits before they, before they even get there. Mm, you built them up so to that it. Your question. Yeah, <laughs> that was a very long answer to a very simple question, wasn't it? Sorry. Uh, well, it reminded me, I've just had uh, seen a blog post written by one of the delegates on the course I run with our mutual friend, Mich Mitch Sullivan, uh, for recruiters. Mm -hmm. And the delegate had written about how uncomfortable she felt as the day went on. And I hadn't picked up her levels of discomfort as one of the trainers during the day, not to the extent that she expressed it. And I felt a little bit bad about that. But then she explained she didn't mind because what was happening was she was stretching her comfort zone. And what happens when you stretch your comfort zone is that it feels a little bit uncomfortable. By definition, yes, we talk about... Um... There's a thing that really winds me up about trainers sometimes when they say leap out of your comfort zone and all that does is freak people out. What you need to be doing is expanding their comfort zone a little so they can step into the into the what was the scary space but is now the safe space. And as you say you give them the tools and the techniques and the advice bit by bit by bit uh, to take yeah. them on a journey. There's a yeah. nice yeah, yeah. cliche. Oh, um, can, we play, can we play cliche, cliche bingo? Uh, we're going on right. a journey. 
Okay. One for me. Uh, and that's one of the things I do on that same course. If the recruiters write anything cheesy, I give them a mini baby bell. But I'm, so, and if they're smart, if they say some, anything smart, they get a tube of Smarties. And uh, so I award myself more cheese than anyone else. I make sure to do that because I think that's one of the ways that helps attendees have a better experience if you make yourself the butt of the joke uh, first. Years ago, I compiled an, a booklet of icebreakers. And I remember you contributed one about throwing ping pong balls with initials. And on the subject of icebreakers, I know the idea of an icebreaker is to warm up an audience. And it's a getting to know you exercise. If you've got people in the room, they're going to be working together all day, maybe, and they don't know each other well. Uh, it can be creeping death to go around and make everybody introduce themselves to each other. And you and I both have different ways of getting them to say who they are and why they're there, what they get out of the day. So can you talk me through that ping pong ball exercise if you still do it and how it works for you? I, I, I don't, but I can talk you through it. It is simply to put um, your initials on, on, on a set of ping pong balls. Everyone stands in a circle and bounces the ping pong ball on the table or the floor. Whoever catches the ping pong ball at the far side, and trust me, ping pong balls have a life of their own. They will, they will defy the laws of physics and they will bounce at 90 degrees to where you think they're going to go. Cue much hilarity for people scrabbling around for ping pong balls. You grab the ping pong ball, that gives you the initial of somebody you need to talk to. Um, and that kind of, the laughter of whose ping pong ball have I got? How did, how did I get your ping pong ball? Uh, starts to break things up you do need to have broken the ice before that though because if that's your first exercise you risk it being a car crash because anybody who isn't ready for that just puts them further back into the cave back into their into their shell as it were uh, so uh, yeah you put in second perhaps if that's your uh second activity then is there a, a learning point from the apart from the hilarity of having to find the person with the right initials what, what uh, benefit is there to the delegates to experience that activity? It raises physical energy um, oh. and it gets them used to moving around, talking to each other. It stops them sitting because inevitably people come in with people they know, they sit with people they know and they want to stay with people they know. Now, there are lots of ways of breaking up those little, little bits and bobs, but this is just a fun way of getting people to talk to people outside of their own I'm going to use the word clique because I don't have a better word for it but their comfort zone, their, their safety net, the people that they know, they come in with and they sit next to the people that they know and this just gets them thinking and talking to other people. And that's the uh, where the word energised comes from. Trainers have always known this, that you need to, if someone's sitting still in a chair for eight hours, they need to get moving to get oxygen to their brain and start thinking fresh thoughts. Oh. Yeah, although there is some interesting research about that at the moment, but almost by definition, your brain is always going to have oxygen. Otherwise, it you'd is be the dead. last part. You're dead, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No matter what else is going on, your body will push oxygen to the brain. That's its last line of defense. So, you don't want to start taking li too literally this idea that you need to reoxygenate the brain and, and stimulate and all that kind of jazz. Think of it more as a metaphor than, a, than, than as a real thing. Uh, well, you have to, because basically, as a real thing, it's just non-existent. It's a fallacy. You don't re-energise the brain in that way. What you do is draw people's attention back into the room and get them to start concentrating again. That's, that's a psychological thing, not a physiological thing. I'm guessing you've often been in an audience and seen a speaker on stage. And as an audience member, you've had to participate in some energisers, activities, games. Don't. So please, please don't make me confess what I want to do to bad presenters when they do that. Please don't make me confess because you're recording this. But we talk about something called the sniper slide, which is the point at which Simon wishes he had a sniper rifle to remove the presenter from, from the front of the room. Yeah, there are some god-awful car crash ones. I, I was at one ooh, less than a week ago where a 21-year-old, bless him, who's never had a real job except what he thought he was doing, um, decided to do the stand up, sit down. You know the one where you just go, stand up if you have ever, yada, 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 yada. And there's a whole bunch of things went wrong with it. The first was 
he didn't spot or take account of the fact that several of his audience were wheelchair users or otherwise couldn't stand up, sit down, which started to make everybody around them feel uncomfortable. And that. Um, the second thing was because he went into it absolutely cold, utterly, utterly, utterly cold, anybody who was introverted or shy or because the two aren't the same, um, or who didn't want to be there, was immediately alienated because they had to stand up. It was, you know, you have to stand up and participate and you were, you were teased a little bit if you didn't. And then the third mistake he made was just asking pointless questions, which were blatantly there just as an energizer. Stand up if you've got blue eyes. Stand up if you drive a Ford. Sit down if you yeddy yeddy. And all that did was drive people like me, who, who are more cynical about this kind of thing, just drove me around the bend and I just wanted to scream after about four questions that's not true i wanted to scream after about two questions i actually managed to avoid it until after four questions <laughs> let's talk a little bit about what you just said introverts and shy people in your audience and that they're different mm -hmm. now my understanding yeah. is that an introvert is someone that gets the energy from being alone and an extrovert gets the energy from being around others from interacting with people yes yeah yes 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 so you can be introverted and shy. I'm not. You can be introverted and outgoing. That I am. Um, I recharge my batteries from being on my own. I dislike forced engagement. I don't want to talk to people who I don't want to talk to. I'm god awful at small talk. I would rather be withdrawn and on my own. But if I have got something to say, I will say it. Come hell or high water, I will, I will say it which means that if you try and drag introverts, and I'm, I'm a particularly bad example, I know, but if you try and drag introverts into what they perceive as puerile, facile engagement for the sake of it, it's, it's like pulling their fingernails. It's the psychological equivalent of pulling their fingernails out. They just resent having to participate. Um, so you need, to, you need to pull these people in very gently, very carefully, because if you pull them in, if you pull them in too quickly, all you do is hack them off. And once they're annoyed at you, they stop being able to listen to your content and all of that kind of, all of that kind of jazz. So I very often find that it's best to start with a paper-based version of an exercise and then move to a small group exercise and then move to a large group exercise so that the introverts have got time to get their head in the game and get themselves, get themselves ready to participate. And what about shy people? you made it the <laughs> not the same yeah yeah they're not because you can be in theory you can be a shy and extrovert and that's a person who gets their energy from talking to people on the outside world but is not sufficiently self-confident to go and talk to them that's kind of the worst case scenario um any trainer worth his or her salt of course has spotted these people as they've come in the door and has found a way to soften the blow for them before the actual formal training starts uh, the number of times i've coincidentally spoken to somebody before when my training session starts just because I just happen to be passing but it turns out that the people I speak to happen to be the people who need that little bit more gentle space or if it's a big session and I've got one of my team with me we're very very good at talking with our eyes <laughs> we just have a just a look across the room um, somebody will raise an eyebrow somebody will glance at somebody else and we know that somebody then needs to go and talk to somebody just to cushion cushion the blow a little bit. So some people just need a little bit more gentle introduction, but they have to have that before a training session starts, because otherwise it's all... Mm. I wish I could spell that. <laughs> I think it's N-G-H-N... Oh, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you're, you're, you're the writer. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, then... Thinking back to yourself as an audience member, have you ever participated in something that you thought, yeah, that really works? I now remember that message a lot better than I would have yeah, yeah. getting engaged. Yeah, there are, there are occasions, yeah, definitely, because there are occasions when the exercise has built into what it was they were trying to teach me. So I've seen that moment where the penny drops and I've gone, oh, yeah, <laughs> that makes sense. Duh, why didn't I, you know, a real face palm moment. Why didn't I realize that for myself? But you can't generalize those because they always have to grow out of what it is that you're, that you're teaching, that you're training, that you're, that you're explaining. Um, generalized exercises 
struggle to do that. I mean, you, you, the best way I find of using them is to take the generalized exercise and then customize it for the content. Um, because if you can't come up with new exercises all day, every day, because we'd, we'd go completely crazy trying to create exercises. So you take the generic stuff and then you customize it for what it is that you're trying to say. And that's one of the reasons I no longer use the ping pong ball exercise all that much because I found that it was a, it was too generic. I couldn't customize it. I couldn't make it work for specific content. Were there any other parts of it that jumped out for you as um, particularly potentially valuable or have I missed the mark on anything from your point of view with your scientific rigor? From, from my point of view, I, I don't think I've got anything more to say other than it, it helps strongly in the learning process if what you're doing, the medium and the message match, match each other. So if it's an isolated exercise for the sake of doing an exercise, all it does is get people's way. Uh, and the other thing to remember, of course, is that this theory of kinesthetic, visual, and aural, or the, the so-called VAC model, to try and teach people that's nonsense, but we kind of know that, but it still floats around in, in the ether, in the atmosphere. So what you should be trying to do is match what you're teaching and the medium by which you teach it, rather than do everything visually and everything orally and everything kinesthetically so that different people learn different things. Tosh! Try learning dancing by listening. You have to learn dancing by doing. Try learning about the Mona Lisa by listening. No, no, you have to, you have to see the damn painting. So the exercises you use should match whatever it is that it is that you're trying to explain. Right. How can people reach you if they want to find out more? Easiest place to start is the website presentationgenius.info or on Twitter, I'm at presentations. Uh, presentationgenius.info is the website and if you want to email me directly it's simon at presentationgenius.info yeah, yeah not hard <laughs> brilliant thank you very much